Hi, everyone. We're excited to be here and uh, we continue to see the numbers growing, but I think it's good to get started since we are a few past the hour. Uh, hello and welcome to the Department of Energy webinar for our very first update report in the Pathways to Commercial Liftoff series. I'm Vanessa Chan, the Chief Commercialization Officer and Director of the Office of Technology Transitions, otherwise known as the Head of the Otters, OTT. Uh, so today uh, we're going to be giving an overview of the updated nuclear liftoff report. And we have with us Jigger Shaw, Director of the Loan Programs Office, Kelly Cummins, Director of the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, and Julie Kozaraki, who is the Director of Strategy for the Loan Programs Office. And three of these folks are my favorite people uh, within DOE. For the posted version, we will also have a very special message from Mike Goff, who is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy. Last year, when we launched these reports, we committed to maintaining live documents, living documents that would be updated as the market evolves. And in nuclear, a lot has changed since we published the original report in March of 2023. And the reason why it's important to update these is anyone who's done commercialization knows it's not linear, things change. And as such, in order to make sure that we are all working from the exact same roadmap, these updates are super critical. And so, Jigger, it'd be great to hear from you. What were the biggest changes that have happened in nuclear in the last year and a half? You're muted, Jigger. Sorry. Like, you think that we'd figure this out by now? Thanks, Vanessa. After decades of flat sales, everyone agrees that the U.S. is getting ready for load growth. This is not just for AI and data centers, but also to support a 3x increase in domestic manufacturing construction investment spurred by the Inflation Reduction Act, and a 5x increase in annual EV sales and other residential load growth. The Inflation Reduction Act also created new loan programs office authorities for existing and new reactors, including 1706, also called the Energy Infrastructure Reinvestment Program. LPO closed its very first 1706 loan this past Monday to Holtec to restart the Palisades nuclear plant, a reactor that ceased operations in 2022 that will provide 800 megawatts of clean, firm power for decades and 600 family-sustaining jobs. For years, the nuclear industry has been largely made up of traditional risk-averse players focused on the safe operation of existing reactors. Now, entrepreneurial companies like Holtec are inspiring companies like Constellation to look at bold moves like their recent announcement about restarting the nuclear plant formerly known as Three Mile Island, now the Crane Clean Energy Center, with Microsoft recognizing the value of clean firm power through a long-term contract. This decision comes after Microsoft, Google, and Nucor did a request for information for the best clean firm ideas in March of 2024. Including nuclear and other clean firm resources reduces the cost of decarbonization by maximizing the use of our limited transmission and pairing it with energy storage and demand flexibility. System modeling shows including nuclear and other clean firm resources with renewables and storage can decrease system costs for decarbonization by 37% versus renewables and storage alone. LPO financing is incredibly impactful for nuclear. In 2014 and 2019, LPO provided $12 billion in loans for Vogel Units 3 and 4, saving ratepayers hundreds of millions of dollars in interest costs. The Inflation Reduction Act also provided substantial tax credits that can be paired with LPO loans for existing reactors. The IRA provided a production tax credit for new reactors, the production tax credit or the 30% investment tax credit that can become 50% with energy community and domestic content adders. It's hard to overstate the impact of increasing the investment tax credit from 30% to 50% on nuclear's levelized cost of electricity, given nuclear is mostly capital cost with low operating costs. Thanks, Jigger. There's some really exciting stuff going on in the loan programs office. And I'm also excited because there's some really impactful work going on in the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. So uh, I just want to say, uh, first of all, Kelly Cummins, I'm the acting director for the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. And we're really trying to lean in as a U.S. government to support the demonstration and deployment of new nuclear. So we have research programs in the Office of Nuclear Energy and demonstration projects in the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, also known as OSED. And those are funded and underway to help de-risk innovative technologies. 
OSED manages the two demonstration projects awarded under the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program. Uh, these are Gen 4 reactors that are innovative nuclear technologies designed to complement the modern energy economy, providing flexible electricity output and process heat for a wide variety of utility and industrial applications, as well as desalination and hydrogen production. And I'm really excited to talk about the fact that in April, excuse me, in uh, earlier this year, in 2024, Congress uh, provided $900 million to support grid scale deployment of uh, generation three plus SMRs. So of this funding, OSED plans to provide up to 800 million to support two first mover teams, while the Office of Nuclear Energy is offering 100 million for fast followers to support their siting, uh, supply chain development, and cost estimating. The goal with this funding is to put projects on a pathway to deployment, while at the same time facilitating a multi-reactor Gen 3 plus SMR order book. In sum, these projects are important investments and tools that can help our nation address the unprecedented load growth described in this report. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that also in, in 2024, uh, Congress provided $2.72 billion to incentivize a domestic fuel supply chain for nuclear. Back over to you, Vanessa. So thank you. It's, it's so exciting what we see Kelly and Jigger leading in their offices. And really the theme of what we're trying to figure out here is how do we maximize the value of these federal investments? How do we move past these first of a kind projects to reach nth of a kind costs? And this is the thing that's been really keeping me up at night because really what we're seeing is the fact that everyone is first in line to be seventh, eighth or ninth. No one is first in line to be first, second or third. And so really what we've done here in this update is lay out also the value of consortium models. A consortium approach is actually going to help us aggregate demand and push through the first mover disadvantage to realize and share cost reductions. Consortium approaches allow customers to all be one fifth of the order book versus waiting to be fifth. And this idea of spreading costs and risks over the subsequent reactors, such that there's no longer benefit to waiting for the fifth project, is super, super critical in the nuclear industry. It's also critical in other technologies, but so much so in nuclear because the costs of these are so high. And a model like this has been executed regularly outside of nuclear. For example, Boeing did not try to sell one very expensive 787 loaded up with all the costs of designing the plane, building production facilities, standing up the supply chain, etc. Instead, Boeing sold 50 787s to the first customer, thereby spreading early costs over multiple planes in a single order. In order to get to commercial liftoff, we know that we have to get to scale. And to get to scale, we have to do many of these quickly. And so this is really the key of how do we uh, incent ourselves to take more risk as an ecosystem and not just wait for a handful of people to go first. And there's no better person to uh, talk through the liftoff report and all the updates we have than Julie, who I would say is the person who's most passionate about nuclear that I've ever met. Uh, and I'm really happy that she is here to explain all the things that we have found in our last year and a half. So Julie, handing it over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much. So I am gonna share my screen and let me know if folks can see that okay. Yep, excellent. All right, so for folks following along at home, these slides are available at liftoff.energy.gov nuclear. This is the summary presentation for the update, um, and it is also available with the full update to, to the report. So you heard a little bit from Jigger about why we updated the report, but just to underscore, Congress created the Loan Programs Office with the Energy Policy Act of 2005 specifically to support the deployment of new nuclear, among many other clean energy technologies. However, we did not have the applications we needed to see for successfully deploying new nuclear at scale. So we originally put together the liftoff reports to identify what it would take to reach liftoff or deployment at scale. And some of the most common questions that we sought to answer were, well, what do we even mean by advanced nuclear? What's its value proposition? And do we even need new nuclear for net zero when we have all these cheap renewables? And the answer is yes. On the order of 200 gigawatts of new nuclear in the US by 2050, which represents a tripling of our current nuclear fleet in line with the commitment the US made at COP28 with over 20 other nations. 
This report was an enormous collaboration between uh, LPO, OSED, OTT, NE, as well as Idaho National Lab and Argonne National Lab. You heard Jigger, Jigger talk about the importance of low growth and the exciting restarts of Palisades on beautiful Lake Michigan and Three Mile Island, but there has also been renewed interest in AP 1000s. And let's be clear, it was impolite in polite society to talk about more AP 1000s in the US just a year ago. But now that Vogel Units 3 and 4 have come online with the perseverance of Southern Company and Georgia Power, making Vogel not just the largest clean energy generator in the United States, but the largest generator of electricity period in the United States, customers are now doing a closer analysis of what happened at Vogel. So for example, Vogel began construction with an incomplete design, an immature supply chain, and an untrained workforce. But now the AP1000 design is complete, their supply chain infrastructure, and Vogel trained over 30,000 workers. So customers are now saying that they really value having that complete constructed design. There's also been a huge recognition of the value of the existing nuclear fleet. A recent, recent National Labs report found that we could fit 60 to 95 gigawatts of new nuclear just at our existing nuclear sites because many of them were designed for four reactors, but we only ever ended up building one or two. Additionally, as recently as 2022, Palisades, reactors were being shut down. In 2024, not only are we restarting recently closed reactors, but most nuclear operators are looking to extend operations to 80 years and uprate existing capacity, which gets you new megawatts at existing reactors. So nuclear offers a really unique value proposition for a net zero grid. And of course, we're going to need multiple energy sources to be successful at scale. But it's important to understand that nuclear is not just clean or carbon-free generation. It's also firm or dispatchable, it has the highest capacity factor of any electricity source, and it's there when you need it. Nuclear also uses land very efficiently and generates more megawatt hours per acre than any other energy source. Nuclear also uses transmission infrastructure very effectively. As you heard Jigger explain, if you look at a number of power system decarbonization models, if you try to use mostly distributor variable resources, it requires an enormous build out of new transmission. Um, and you can also imagine that using transmission with an asset like nuclear that uses it more than 90% of the time allows you to build out less infrastructure versus only using it 30% of the time. Nuclear also, has really concentrated local economic benefits. And this is not just the direct jobs or the high quality, high paying jobs at the plant, but it's also the knock on economic benefits of companies siting where they can get clean firm power. And you see this in Georgia, for example, where we have a lot of EV and battery manufacturers locating and siting in Georgia in order to access the grid bolstered by the power coming online from Vogel. Finally, Nuclear also has a number of additional applications beyond just bulk electricity, and in particular, that's providing high quality steam and high temperature heat for industrial applications that have very few decarbonized alternatives. But what about the cost? Well, great news. As you heard from Jigger, including nuclear and other clean firm resources with renewables decreases the cost of decarbonization. So I'll repeat that. It is cheaper to decarbonize with nuclear. And this is a view from a study that looked at decarbonizing California, a state that has terrific solar availability. And the scenario on the left is one where you try to decarbonize with renewables and storage alone. And the scenario on the right is one where you add nuclear to that system. Uh, the paper actually used three different models and they all came to the same conclusion. Uh, in aggregate, it's about 40% cheaper when you pair nuclear with renewables. So to underscore, Nuclear is not competing with renewables. It's not displacing renewables. We need huge amounts of both new nuclear and new renewable capacity to decarbonize efficiently. So we've got to build all the solar and wind we possibly can as fast as we can, and then we still need the nuclear. And to be clear, these cost savings come from not only avoiding the need to build additional generation capacity, so building additional solar panels and wind farms, but it also reduces the need to build additional energy storage as well as additional transmission. These are two scenarios for decarbonizing the whole US power sector by 2050. 
And you can see that when you have a system that is about 40% clean firm capacity versus 20% clean firm, you can avoid building an additional you know, 1,200 gigawatts of capacity. So that combination of variable renewables with clean firm sources like nuclear uh, leads to the most efficient outcomes. And to be clear, what do we mean by advanced nuclear? So for us, Advanced nuclear includes both Gen 3 Plus, which are light water reactors with passive safety, like the AP-1000s built at Bogle, as well as Gen 4 reactors, which use coolants other than water. And it's important to note um, that non-light water reactors are not new. We've actually built many of these designs, including sodium reactors and high temperature gas reactors as far back as the 1950s. And we've been at a few on the grid in the 1970s. Uh, but the whole operating fleet right now are large light water reactors. Uh, we also include reactors of all sizes, so that's everything from the large gigawatt scale reactors in the current fleet to SMRs, which are usually about 50 to 350 megawatts, as well as micro reactors, which can be between 1 and 50 megawatts. And it's really important to understand the roles of both large and small reactors, because we need both. So these charts here show comparisons of uh, cost simulations for a large boiling water reactor and a small boiling water reactor. And you can see in the chart on the left uh, that pretty consistently, the large reactor is cheaper dollars per kilowatt. So that's an overnight construction cost. And that also translates to being cheaper in dollars per megawatt hour or in the cost per generation. However, just because of the sheer size of these larger reactors, they do lead to larger overall project costs. So you can see that the median cost for the larger reactor is greater than the small, despite having the lower cost uh, per kilowatt and per megawatt hour. But it is really, really tough to beat the economies of scale from big reactors, um, and they are essential for bulk electricity production. We did make the reactors bigger over time on purpose. Um, so for example, in our current fleet, all the reactors under 870 megawatts were started construction in the 1960s, and we pushed them up in size over time. And the biggest reactor we have is actually almost 1,400 megawatts, uh, which is Grand Gulf down in Louisiana. And of course, uh, we're going to need reactors of all sizes, and small reactors have a number of benefits and advantages, particularly for replacing smaller retiring coal sites or industrial applications where you really need that high temperature heat and high quality steam. And when we talk about tripling capacity to 200 gigawatts by 2050, uh, that can sound intimidating, but it's important to know that we have built a lot of nuclear before in this country. So in 1974, uh, we brought 12 reactors online for 10 and a half gigawatts of new capacity. And if we hit a steady state of 13 gigawatts per year by around 2041, we'd be able to get to that uh, 200 gigawatt target by 2050. So it's important to remember that we have done this before um, and we can do it again. Another important thing to know about having a nuclear fleet that was largely built in the 1970s and 80s is that it is essential to invest in the license renewals for those reactors. So initial licenses for nuclear reactors are granted for 40 years. Um, initial license renewals get you to 60 years, and subsequent license renewals, or SLRs, get you to 80 years. So it's not a given that we'll be able to keep all this existing fleet capacity online, and investing in those SLRs early and doing the appropriate planning will be essential for maintaining all of this capacity uh, through 2050, and it's going to require really dedicated planning and investment to get there. Another fact about our existing fleet is that Although our existing fleet is only light water reactors and only boiling and pressurized water reactors, we've actually built over 50 different unique designs. So almost all of the nuclear reactors in this country are special snowflakes. And so when you hear folks ask about, well, why hasn't nuclear seen learning benefits over time? Surely there must just be something uniquely wrong with nuclear. It's important to remember that we've effectively done over 50 first of a kind projects. And it is essential to down select and standardize reactor designs to 
actually come down the cost curve, because you can imagine that building 10 first of a kind projects is a lot less efficient than building 10 within a design where you get really good and get enough at bats to really recognize cost reductions. And in the United States, we are private sector led and government enabled. So it's gonna be up to the industry and to customers to pick the designs they like and are most comfortable with, but down selecting and standardizing reactor designs is essential for reducing costs for everyone. Final fun fact about our existing fleet is that 20 operating nuclear sites and five formerly operating nuclear sites are in communities that are eligible for the energy community tax credit bonus. So you heard Jigger describe some of the substantial tax credits that the IRA created for nuclear. That includes the 48E ITC investment tax credit and the 45Y production tax credit or PTC. And so for the ITC, uh, being in an energy community allows you to get up to a 40% investment tax credit. And if you add the domestic content bonus, that gets you to a 50% ITC. And for those keeping score at home, a 50% investment tax credit is buy one reactor, get one free. You also get enormous benefits from using these existing sites. Um, in addition to the eligibility for the tax credits, you also have access to all of the siting and characterization that was done for the original licensing. They also have access to water and interconnection. And perhaps most importantly, they also have communities who love and understand the value of nuclear. Nuclear consistently polls most favorably with folks who live right near the plant because they really understand the benefits that nuclear brings to the community in terms of high quality, high paying jobs and a tax base. Um, and so many of these sites were designed for four or more reactors, but we only built one or two. So just using these uh, 54 existing sites and some of the recently closed sites, there's room for 60 to 95 gigawatts of new nuclear um, just at these existing sites, which is an incredibly valuable asset that it is time for us to capitalize on. But where are we today? Uh, the liftoff report identifies three key stages for achieving commercial liftoff. And the nuclear industry is building momentum to break the commercial stalemate. But the first step for achieving liftoff is generating a committed order book. And so those are signed contracts, not just MOUs or letters of intent, but signed contracts for that critical mass of five to 10 reactors of the same design. Uh, following that, it will of course be essential to deliver those projects on time and on budget um, before we're able to realize that full potential of completely industrializing and reaching deployment at scale. And if we wait, it will get harder and more expensive. If we delay deployment out into the mid 2030s, we run the risk of having to so overbuild the supply chain that it will be more expensive and more difficult to meet our goals. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, if we hit that steady state of about 13 gigawatts per year in 2031, we'll be able to meet that target by 2050. But if we wait and if we delay on things like those power up rates at the existing fleets and investing in new build capacity as soon as possible, it will be very difficult to reach those goals by 2050. But folks get very focused on the nuclear reactor design. And it's important to keep in mind that it's gonna take a lot of different entities, a lot of different companies to fill a lot of important roles to make these projects successful. You heard Vanessa describe the benefits of the consortium model to help aggregate demand and form partnerships. So you could, for example, build that order book, 10 reactors of the same design. And in the report, we introduce a couple of potential constructs, including utilities working together to pick the same design and come down the cost curve to generate savings for all of their ratepayers, uh, or aggregating demand from big tech companies like Microsoft and Google and Amazon. Uh, but selecting that reactor design is important, but it's only step one. There are really key roles in project management and in construction that are essential to be filled with the right expertise to ensure that these projects are delivered successfully. And data that shows the importance of filling those roles successfully is the cost estimate of Vogel over time. So you'll often hear folks talking, well, Vogel, you know, more than doubled in cost. But something that really stands out is that when Southern Company 
the uh, owning and operating utility took over the role of project ownership and management in 2017. They reset the budget to within about 25% of where it landed seven years later, which raises a really important question about how much really was cost overrun versus how much was cost underestimation. And it underscores how incredibly important it is to invest upfront before you ever put a shovel in the ground in finalizing the design and getting to a really detailed mature cost estimate. Because as you spend more time getting to a better cost estimate, those risk and cost bands get narrower and narrower. And the book, uh, How Big Things Get Done, illustrates some really important lessons that are applicable, uh, not just for nuclear, but for all mega projects. Some additional important data from Vogel is that there was major improvement just between the build of Unit 3 and Unit 4. So these are the days between major milestones, at Unit 3 and 4, and you can see that they all dramatically improved, uh, with one of them going from taking over a year to under three months. And of course, it is tough to totally disaggregate the costs um, in accounting, given the shared resources, shared site. But generally speaking, Unit 3 was about 30% more efficient to build and about 20% cheaper, which is a really powerful testament to the importance of building even just one more unit within the same design. And so with that, the natural question is, well, what would the next AP1000s look like? So fortunately, an MIT study came out a few weeks ago that looked bottoms up at the costs of Vogel and identified that in in-year costs, Vogel was about $11,000 per kilowatt. And so we'll call that the overnight capital cost as if you could build it overnight without accruing interest. Uh, if you inflate that all into $2024, you get to about $15,000 a kilowatt. But something really important to understand is that about $3,000 per kilowatt of that cost were true first-of-a-kind costs that really couldn't recur again. Now that you have a complete design, a supply chain that's been stood up and a workforce that's been trained. There were also some project specific inefficiencies that would be really difficult to replicate. And that's that you know roughly 4,000 a kilowatt cost bucket here. And so for example, that's something like using the NRC's part 52 process with an incomplete design that led to almost 200 license amendment requests and a cycle of costly rework and delay. Uh, but this time around, if you use the NRC's Part 52 with a complete design, it would be much more efficient um, and more used as intended. So if you take out those buckets of the true first-of-a-kind costs and the Vogel-specific uh, issues, you get down to a two-unit cost for the next AP1000s of about 8,300 a kilowatt. And then you can take 40% of that cost out with the investment tax credit. So we're, we'll assume that you'll be able to use one of those adders because, for example, uh, Vogel, which the site actually has room for more reactors, is an energy community and would qualify for at least that 40% investment tax credit. And to underscore the importance of economies of scale, if you're able to build four units at the same site um, where you're able to use the same workforce and benefit from all the lessons you've learned, you can get down to about 7,500 a kilowatt. Uh, note, these are just for the next AP1000s and the nth of a kind costs, or when you recognize most of those cost reductions is expected to be closer to about 4,700 uh, a kilowatt. But what does that mean for LCOE? The report, we have a few pages that talk about how flawed of a metric LCOE is and what it leaves out, but the people want LCOE, and so we give them LCOE. And in this chart, um, there are a lot of boxes and numbers, but, but bear with me. We'll start with the actual values for Vogel. So that 11,000 a kilowatt overnight cost, construction time about 11 years, 3.5% interest rate on the debt, uh, about 60% of the project cost uh, provided by debt, so that was from LPO, uh, the 45J production tax credits with older tax credit and a 15-year depreciation period. And that gets you to an LCOE of about $126 a megawatt hour. This is going to be a lot lower than what you've seen reported in some other places, and it's important to note some of these assumptions here, particularly the lower interest rate that Vogel is able to get from using LPO. A lot of other LCOE assumptions assume much higher interest rate, which for nuclear has an outsized impact on the total cost of the project. 
But let's inflate those costs into today's dollars. And let's also put ourselves in the higher interest rate environment we're at now with 5% interest rates. And just that alone, inflation and interest rates get you to about a 50% increase in the LCOE. But now let's see the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act benefits and fully using LPO. So for example, LPO is able to provide loans that cover 80% of eligible costs. So if you increase from 60 to 80% of costs, you already drop down about $30 a megawatt hour. If you then layer in the 40% investment tax credit, you've taken out another 50 or so dollars per megawatt hour down to about 100. And then this is a much underappreciated benefit of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, makers, the Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System, allows you to depreciate an entire nuclear power plant in just five years. And so if you built another AP1000, at the same cost as Vogel, inflated into today's dollars and higher interest rate environment, but you just fully loaded it up with IRA and LPO benefits, you'd already be under $100 a megawatt hour. You don't even have to assume that you'd have recognized any cost or schedule improvement. So the last pieces that we tacked on here were if you get down to call it that six-year construction period or that 8,300 a kilowatt overnight cost that we saw in the charts before, then you're looking at an LCOE that's closer to 60 or $80 uh, a megawatt hour. And if you don't believe me, you can run the numbers yourself. We will be uh, publishing the model that we use for this. It is actually NREL's LCOE model, and we layered on top of it a nuclear dashboard that allows you to adjust uh, some of these key assumptions and see the impact on LCOE. Uh, one of those important uh, drawbacks of LCOE that we talked through in the report is that it only captures the capitalization period. So call it that 30 years when you're paying back the debt. But as we talked about, nuclear plants are able to operate for call it 80 years. So you get an additional 50 years of cheap, clean, reliable power. And existing nuclear plants operate in a really tight, predictable band of call it 30 to $35 a megawatt hour. And the time value money makes it very difficult to quantify, you know, cash flow 60 or 70 years from now. But these are multi-generational infrastructure assets that future generations and the children and grandchildren of today's ratepayers will benefit from. And so even if those first few years during the capital recovery period are more expensive, you have 50 years of cheap, clean, reliable power that future ratepayers are able to benefit from. And that's something that really isn't well captured in LCOE. Uh, the report also goes through some of the uh, remaining barriers to liftoff and some potential solutions. And so very briefly, one of those is that market power prices do not consistently compensate nuclear for all the value it provides. So those are just some of the things we talked about, like decarbonization and reliability. So system modeling efforts consistently show the cost-saving benefits of including nuclear and other clean firm resources versus just some of those asset-by-asset asset LCOE um, comparisons. Innovative power purchasing is a really key tool for large large off-takers to catalyze new projects. So you see examples of that in Microsoft's PPA that they have signed with Constellation to help bring back uh, formerly Thurber Island and now the Crane Clean Energy Center. Uh, clean firm standards that could specify, for example, needing 20 to 40% of the portfolio to be clean firm could help drive nuclear deployment, similar to how renewable portfolio standards help support solar and wind deployment at scale. Um, and a standard value or price for clean firm could help decision makers account for some of those enormous benefits in decarbonization and reliability. Um, but at the end of the day, some broader electricity market reforms um, could also help incentivize investment in new clean firm generation uh, that perhaps were not contemplated when we were not in this low growth and decarbonization focused environment a few years ago. But of course, many potential customers even when accounting for all these benefits, cite cost or cost overrun risk as the primary barrier to their ability to commit to new nuclear projects. Um, and there are a number of mechanisms for sharing the cost to lower barrier to entry, as well as ensuring costs and on-budget delivery that we'll talk about um, on the next page here. But I do want to note that because 
Vogel was the first start to finish new nuclear construction project in 35 years, the US has to develop nuclear and mega project delivery infrastructure. The integrated project delivery model aligns incentives, not just between owners and contractors, but all participants of the project to help ensure uh, on time, on budget delivery. And the report walks through some of the key tenants um, to ensure that every participant in the project is aligned toward on budget delivery. Funding constructability research could also help target the drivers of cost overruns and improve project delivery. And that's a separate from you know, basic uh, reactor science um, versus you know, how we are able to do things like reduce the amount of welding required to deliver these uh, construction projects. So the final piece um, I'll, I'll leave you with here that we provide more detail on in the report are the variety of tools that nuclear projects have to both share and reduce costs and risks. And these are pretty differentiated avenues. And the first of those is sharing costs across participants to lower the barrier to entry. And so this is like Vanessa described, a consortium committing to five to 10 or more reactors of the same design to lower the average cost for everyone. Uh, financial assistance, like the grant programs that Kelly mentioned, that OSED and the Office of Nuclear Energy are leaning into, uh, or potentially even government build and ownership of new nuclear. Uh, the investment tax credit uh, is a way to both share costs between projects and the federal government, as, way, as well as a way to ensure resiliency through cost scenarios. So following the publication of the initial report, a lot of customers and other stakeholders said that they needed something that looked or felt like cost over at insurance in order to commit to new nuclear projects. And it's really important to understand that that 30 to 50% investment tax credit functionally serves as over an insurance because the ITC applies to the entire capital cost of the project, regardless of initial budget. So the government is already offering to pay for 30 to 50% of the overrun, which as you could imagine, would, make an, would have made an enormous difference um, for uh, vocal ratepayers, and is an incredibly important commitment to sharing some of these costs for building these new generational infrastructure assets. Uh, Government-enabled offtake certainty, uh, as we've seen many other countries do in models like contract for difference, could also help provide some of that cost certainty. But in addition to sharing those costs, it's also important to ensure resiliency through different cost scenarios. So that's sharing the unexpected cost during construction. And so there are a number of tools like um, completion guarantees and uh, contingent equity that can help provide support through different scenarios. And the Loan Programs Office, as Jigger explained, is incredibly important for lowering the overall cost of nuclear projects. And LPO can actually structure contingent debt that you only have to draw on if you need it. Uh, flexible PPA prices with some of those uh, big tech company or industrial off-takers could also be essential for ensuring that there are paths to success through multiple cost scenarios. Finally, um, both of these must be paired with actually ensuring project management best practices to promote on-time, on-budget delivery. And so this reduces those unexpected costs. And so these are things like getting to really mature cost estimates that narrow the bands for where the cost could finally land incorporating construction best practices from Vogel and other recent mega projects, um, and ensuring that all of the cost reductions for getting from first of a kind or FOAC to nth of a kind or NOAC are implemented. And following the original publication of this report, uh, Idaho National Lab, Argonne National Lab, and MIT collaborated on a tool that actually identifies the relative impact of the most impactful levers for getting from first to nth of a kind cost. So with that, I want to make sure that we have some time for questions, but there are additional resources at liftoff.energy.gov slash advanced nuclear. That includes the full report, the summary presentation we just walked through today, and in a few days, we'll also have the LCOE model that we use to generate the figures in this report. So you can test the assumptions yourself and see the impact of those incredibly powerful IRA benefits. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing my screen and we can move into Q&A. Um, I think that I was going to have um, help in moderating some of these questions. Um, I see that we <laughs> got a number of these in the chat. Um, could I perhaps 
tap. You on. Wanna, um, I can go through that, Julie. Um, do we do we have a link to the paper um, on the thirty seven percent cost reduction? Yes. So uh, that is uh, cited right underneath the report, and so that is uh, Bake at all. But I can pop that in the uh, in the chat here. Great. And then I think there's there's some questions around what's really possible from a timing perspective, right? Is it even possible to build a new reactor by 2031? Certainly. So it's important to consider for uh, new projects in the report lays out a couple of timelines based on historical builds, um, not just the actual time for construction, but that time before construction. And so for every design except the AP1000, they've got to work through that design completion phase, um, as well as get through that pre-construction planning and then work through construction. Um, so our best option for pre-2031 capacity are those power up rates at the existing fleet. And there might be between two and eight gigawatts of power up rates available at our existing reactors. And you should probably expect the early 2030s for new reactors. Um, the next fastest one, for example, might be um, another AP1000 where we work through a construction period of about six to seven years. So you could imagine if you started tomorrow, getting that online by uh, 2032 or so could be ambitious, but, but achievable. There were some questions around the fact that some of the modern SMRs are designed for heat. Does the report really talk through the value of, you know, using nuclear for heat? Absolutely. And so you heard Kelly talk about some of the incredible benefits of um, some of the Gen 4 designs for industrial decarbonization. And so we include that as part of nuclear's value proposition, where in many cases there are very few decarbonized alternatives um, because nuclear not only provides that high temperature heat, high quality steam, but it provides it in a very limited footprint, which is important for industrial facilities. Um, and so that is a really key component. So you can think about there being probably three distinct market niches for nuclear. There's your bulk electricity generation, and that includes for AI and data centers. You have those more specialty industrial applications that require her temperature, heat, and steam. And then microreactors are really great for a different set of applications that's more uh, remote or military applications where you're trying to offset really expensive diesel generation, where sometimes folks are paying five or $600 a megawatt hour today. There's some questions in here around, while the large reactors might be uh, cheaper on, you know, sort of a modeling basis, you know, on a practical basis, you know, how many locations are there in the United States where you could build a four pack of large reactors? Certainly. So I really recommend that folks check out the new report from the Office of Nuclear Energy and Oak Ridge National Lab that looks at um, the footprint at existing sites. I will note, though, that a lot of those sites that looks at the existing boundary and a lot of existing nuclear sites have land around it that's that's undeveloped where you could have even more room for building um, more reactors, but it is important to probably prioritize those sites where there's not just room for one, but you have room for two or more. Um, and that might require, for example, looking beyond that existing site boundary and into um, some of the uh, larger sites. But I do think it's important to mention, uh, Jigger, as you highlighted, that there are, of course, use cases for both large and small reactors. Um, and in particular, there are many retiring uh, coal facilities where you might just not, you know, need 11 or 2200 megawatts at one site. And so SMRs um, might be a great choice uh, for those. But for folks who are looking for a lot of cheap bulk power, it's really tough to beat the dollars per megawatt hour on big reactors um, like, like the AP1000. And so you can see that in, you know, France, for example, where they get more than 70% of their electricity from large light water reactors like ours. Just building on the answers to the last three questions, someone was asking about like, what do you really have to believe to reach 13 gigawatts a year by 2031? Um, you know, which is sort of in the report, right? Like, what do you have to believe in terms of the implementation of the Advance Act, the, uh, you know, like number of reactors we're choosing, like, you know, the sites we're using, et cetera? Certainly. So chapter three walks through how we would have to commensurately triple all of the stages of that value chain. So that includes the whole fuel supply chain, everything from uh, sourcing uranium to 
uh, converting, enriching, and fabricating it for fuel. There's also the component supply chain, where we'll have to both build up capacity domestically, as well as figure out how to work with our international uh, partners and friends and ensuring um, resilient supply chains to support that capacity. Uh, licensing will also be very important. So we expanded and added a lot, a lot of new content on the great work that the NRC is doing to really streamline uh, their work. The Advance Act provides a really important framework for prioritizing some of those most uh, important actions, but I also think it's really important for folks to understand how to best use the resources that the NRC has today. Um, so I'll just underscore that in the report, for example, we go through that uh, Vogel selected the NRC's Part 52 process, um, which is a combined uh, construction and operating. Part 50 has those separately, and it's much more flexible and accommodating if you end up making changes during construction versus the design you expected on paper. Um, and so Part 52 might be better suited for those complete designs, nth of a kind um, constructions where you're looking for more streamlining. And for those first of a kind projects where you're expecting some changes during construction, Part 50 uh, might be more accommodating. So I think that we will, of course, have a lot of heavy lifting to do across the value chain. Um, but these are all things that at the end of the day help support um, high quality, high paying jobs um, here in the U.S. and support decarbonizing resiliently. You may have mentioned this, but just to reinforce it, you know, why is fusion not considered in the report? Yes. Um, so uh, fission and fusion are going to follow very different paths to commercialization and deployment at scale. Uh, fission is a technology that we've had commercially operating successfully since the 1950s. Shipping port uh, in Pennsylvania came online in 1957. Um, and so we have over 70 years of operating experience with large light, light water reactors. Um, and as I mentioned, um, I'm just going <laughs> to underscore this again. Uh, Gen 4 or non-light water reactors um, are uh, many designs we have built before and we know that they work. So we've built sodium reactors and high temperature gas reactors. And um, these new designs, particularly the ones um, being supported in the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program at OSED, offer a lot of additional advantages. But we do know that the uh, basic reactor science uh, works and we have a proven history with that. Fusion, of course, um, is in a different stage of their commercialization journey and is going to make great use of some of those uh, other resources throughout the Department of Energy and National Labs infrastructure, uh, whereas Fission is more ready for that later stage set of resources like the Loan Programs Office. Feel free to not answer this if this is not your expertise, but there are a lot of questions around what we're doing around uranium and, you know, LEU fuel and HALU fuel and, um, you know, and some of those issues. Absolutely. So Congress passed $2.7 billion to help support the build out of a domestic supply chain. And that includes authorities for both HALU and for LEU. And this is an effort that the Office of Nuclear Energy is spearheading and is going to lead to some pretty um, exciting new capacity and developments um, here in the US. You know, I think folks, for example, saw the recent announcement that Arano, the French uh, enrichment company, is looking to now build a facility uh, here in Tennessee. So um, very important to note that there was strong bipartisan support in Congress for building out the domestic fuel supply chain, and there is a lot of real money and real commitment behind it. Hey, I think that's all of the questions that I could uh, see in the chat. Um, I appreciate everyone joining. Any other parting words, Julie? Uh, yes, I am also absolutely overwhelmed <laughs> by the volume of questions in the chat here. Um, I will just underscore um, what an incredible collaboration this represented between not just offices across um, DOE, but the national labs as well. Um, and we are doing our best to provide resources that are not only helpful, but responsive to folks' needs. So for example, we're really looking forward to publishing um, the interactive LCOE model that'll help folks test uh, the impact of these assumptions and really help folks internalize the benefits that the government has put on the table. Um, I often feel that there has been an underappreciation of the heft of the IRA benefits, not just in the tax credits, but in what the increased LPO authorities mean for new nuclear. Um, so we are looking forward to sharing those resources with folks, uh, getting new reactors built and getting those dollars out the door. Thank you, everybody. 
And uh, these webinars uh, live online after a little bit of uh, post editing at, at liftoff.energy.gov. Thanks everybody for joining us.